Hello, uh, welcome back to the Queen City Guitar Shop. Um, so the last video I left off, or the last series of videos I left off, um, working with the binding and the purfling on the guitar and uh, leveling off all of the purfling. And since then, I've done quite a bit of work off camera. Um, most recently, uh, I made a neck blank, or sort of all along, I guess, I was making this neck blank. Um, but I got it recently to the point where I could slot and shape the fingerboard and glue it on. Um, and of course, before gluing the fingerboard on, I also cut uh, the mortise and tenon for the bolt-on neck um, and flossed the joint so that the heel shoulders fit nicely against the top of the guitar, the body of the guitar. Um, and then I glued the fretboard on. I didn't make a video about that process because I don't feel like I do anything particularly different. Um, and it's pretty pretty basic for the most part. Um, but if somebody was interested in that, uh, I would consider making a video in the future of that process. Um, so I guess if you're interested, let me know. Uh, additionally, I've done some aesthetic work on the guitar. Um, I did a partial backstrip inlay and an ingraft inlay on the body, um, and I also did some um, sort of violin style purfling around the headstock after I veneered and shaped the, the headstock. Um, I say violin style because this section around the edges that kind of looks like binding is actually just part of the veneer and I just cut a channel in uh, offset from the edge to inlay this multi-line purfling. It's the same purfling as the body of the guitar. It's a little bit of extra decorative element. Uh, and I cut this hole in it, sort of a sculptural element. I still need to do a little bit of shaping work on that. Um, but now with all of that done, we are at one of my favorite parts of the guitar build, which is carving the actual neck. Um, and I know a lot of people do the neck carving by drawing on a profile um, and laying out facets to cut into the neck with a band, with a bandsaw. Um, I don't have a bandsaw to do that with, and I tend to take a more um, intuitive sort of feeling-based approach to carving the neck. Uh, I don't have a practice of drawing out profiles and trying to arrive exactly at a profile. I more have an idea of the shape of the neck I want and then I will continuously check it for feel um, and measure it for thickness as I go. For this guitar I'm gonna do uh, a soft V and that is a neck profile that I both don't have a lot of experience playing on and I also don't have any experience carving so I'm gonna do a little bit more layout work than I would normally do um, as I go through the, the carving process. Ordinarily, I would only do some cuts in the back of the neck as depth gauges so that I can visually see how the neck is being carved as I work it. Um, you know, as I'm roughing out the material, I don't have to constantly, in the early stages of the carving, be checking the thickness of everything. Um, I'm still going to do that on this guitar, but I'm also probably going to do a little bit of more intentional layout work. Uh, when I get a little bit further along. Um, and since I don't have a bandsaw to work with for neck removal and I don't I don't want to rasp away all of this waste wood as a carve, um, I'm going to rely heavily on spoke shaves. Um, predominantly this spoke shave with a curved sole, um, which is maybe part of the reason I really like carving necks because the spoke shave is just a lot of fun to use. Um, it's more fun to use when it's really sharp. Uh, I recently sharpened all of my tools. It's a good idea to check any of the carving implements you're going to use on a neck before you start to make sure that they're either freshly sharpened or retaining a really good edge because it'll make life a lot easier. Um, so those are sharp and ready to go. Um, and they're going to do the brunt of the work until I get to the very end when I'm going to use rasps and sandpaper just to, 
you know, do the final shaping of everything and smoothing of everything. Um, so we're going to start with the laying out the depth cuts. Um, they are not going to be needing to be super accurate, and they're not going to define the ultimate depth. But while I'm carving with the spoke shave, they allow me to get a quick visualization of how material removal is going in different parts of the neck. Um, I know that the spoke shave is going to want to remove more t material in the middle. Um, and it, it's possible that side to side it might remove more. So the, the cuts allow me to see how that's progressing and know that, oh, I need to stop working on the middle so I can work on the nut area or the, you know, the nut side of the neck or the heel side of the neck, whichever needs more attention so that I can bring everything down at the same time, at the same rate, uh, which will make arriving at a smooth profile of the shaft a lot easier. So to lay those out, um, the first trick is, of course, that I need to account for the radius fretboard, because I've already radius this, I radiused it, I inlaid these uh, fret markers, and now if I was to measure off the edge of the fretboard, it would be a different thickness than if I measure off the middle. <coughs> Excuse me. So the easiest way to do that, I think, is to get the calipers. Um, this is assuming that the neck blank is pretty, pretty square and even, um, so that you know the middle is not going to be a lot thicker than the edges. Uh, this neck blank is, you know, at the first fret which is where I'm going to make the first cut, it's like 21.97 on one side and it's 22.07 on the other, so it, it's pretty even. Um, certainly a tenth of a millimeter is, is not a big deal. So I'm going to just cite the calipers to make sure I'm registering off the middle of the fretboard. And I see we have 28 and a quarter millimeter thickness. Um, and then I can measure from here and get 22.03 right now. Um, 28 and a quarter minus 22. So that's going to be, well, now I'm getting, I'd measured these before and it's not agreeing, but now I'm getting more like 28.46. Um, which agrees with my earlier measurement that the fretboard is 6.5 millimeters thick on the first fret. Um, and I want to do a depth cut at the first fret and a little bit before we transition to the heel. So on this guitar that's going to be just a little ahead of the tenth fret. And then I also think it's helpful to have one in the middle. Um, of course because the spoke shave is going to tend to remove more wood in the middle. So I'm going to put that at the fifth fret on this guitar. Um, I've already measured the fretboard at those points ahead of time. I get 6.4 millimeters at the fifth fret and six and a quarter at the tenth. Um, so I know that, and it's helpful to know. So it's helpful to know at this point. Uh, even if you don't know exactly how thick you want the neck to be when you finally end up, it's helpful to know that I know it shouldn't be any thicker than this. So I'm going to say 23 millimeters is as thick as I want the first fret area of this neck. Um, and I want to make the cut based upon that. And I know that I'm going to taper the neck as it moves towards the heel. Um, I'm intending probably about two millimeters of taper um, by the time it reaches the heel. So we're going to factor that in as I mark these. Um, I'm going to start by simply squaring a line around. I'm just putting the square on the shelf of the neck and I'm going to mark down on both sides. Just at the first fret, using the first fret to cite this, and then I can connect those really quick just to guide myself with saw visually. Um, and now I can make a mark on this line to 
to give myself the correct depth to cut in from the back. So I know this is six and a half millimeters. To hit 23, I would want to hit, I would want the, um, the cedar portion of the neck to be 16 and a half millimeters. But I don't want to cut straight down to what I'm anticipating might be my final dimension. I want to leave a little bit of space um, between where the cut ends and where the final dimension is. I'm obviously not going to use these for extremely accurate depth measurements. They're only visual. When I get down to the last millimeter or so, I'm going to be using the calipers to test the taper along the entire neck um, at much finer you know, increments so that I arrive at a, a truly smooth profile with a good taper, uh, which is important for the relief that the neck is going to take on when it has strings on it. Um, so I'm going to leave myself about a millimeter and a half, which means that I want about 18 millimeters down to make this mark, and I'm going to cut into that mark. So I'm going to mark 18 millimeters on both sides of the neck. And now I know that when I cut across the grain into the back of the neck, I want to stop when I hit this mark on both sides. And then as I carve down, when that mark disappears, I know that I'm within a millimeter and a half or so of what I'm anticipating being my final thickness. So then to account for the taper, um, I'm simply going to do the same thing. Uh, I'll probably make the fifth fret, you know, a millimeter more. So instead of 18, it'd be like 19, because 6.4 is basically the same as 6.5, and I don't want to get into super math trying to do it with just a ruler. Um, so it'd be like 19, and I'll extend it a little more for for the tenth fret. I'm gonna cut those in, um, and I'm gonna start roughing in a neck down to those lines, at least close. I'm, not going to take them away. Um, I'm also going to cut the heel away, which is the coping saw, so that I don't have to spoke shave these away. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to start removing everything that isn't a neck on this block of wood. And at some point in that process, uh, we'll pick back up and we'll talk a little bit more about the neck carving. Uh, but until then, Alright, so we're about 45 minutes of actual work time into the rough shaping of this neck and these disappearing saw curves combined um, with the fact that the edge of the blank is getting real close to the edge of the fingerboard tell me that we're just about done with the fast portion of this neck carve. Um, I still have a little bit of roughing out that I'd like to do but I thought I would stop here and maybe talk a little bit about some particulars of this process. Just a, just a couple things. So, as I was saying, um, I have just been focused on roughing out the shape of this neck. Uh, it's a process that goes by pretty quickly. I tend to work really quickly. And I'm mostly focused on taking that big rectangular neck block that's full of right angles and 
making it into something that more closely approximates the shape of a guitar neck. Um, but I'm not looking for anything specific at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking for something that's more guitar neck-like, and I'm looking to bring everything down towards their final dimensions uh, at an even pace. You'll see in the time lapse I'm working various parts of the neck, um, switching back and forth between them. I don't spend a lot of time on any one particular area on the neck. Um, a little time on the heel, a little time on the shaft, a little time on the sides, uh, a little more time on the heel. I'm switching back and forth a lot. Um, and that's because I don't want to bring any one portion of the neck really close to completion while the rest are still far out. Um, it's just a personal preference of mine. Uh, lots of people do things in different ways and the way that feels comfortable for you to build a neck, to carve a neck, is definitely going to be the best way. Um, you also notice that I'm switching back and forth between this fixture and the pair of vise. Um, this is the first time you've used this fixture. In the past I've done everything with the pair of vise and it works, works well. Um, it's a little bit annoying because you generally have to brace the neck against yourself while it's also clamped in the vise to carve most elements on the neck, uh, which can be difficult. Uh, sometimes it can be sore for, for your stomach. Um, but I think it works really well. Uh, I happen to have this big hunk of wood. It's like an inch and a half thick, uh, maybe seven inches tall, and maybe 30-ish inches long that I picked up in a discount bin at a store. Um, I haven't committed to the idea of it being a neck carving fixture, so I haven't modified it in any way um, because it's, I believe, some kind of African mahogany and I might want to make uh, blocks, heel blocks, tail blocks, that sort of thing out of it. Um, but if I do decide to use it as a neck, neck carving fixture, I will probably do some modifications so that I can clamp everything more securely and also so that I can rotate the neck 90 degrees so that I don't have to switch back and forth between the pair of ice and the fixture. Um, to be able to access the sides, I like when I'm taking the sides flush with the fingerboard, um, I like to be able to see it a little better than I can if the fingerboard's facing down. Um, another note is that up to this point, I've only used spoke shaves to do the carving. Um, once I finish the rough out, the heel especially, and the nut will, I'll begin to rely more heavily upon uh, rasps um, and chisels and knives. But up to the point of roughing everything out, I can pretty much get by with a spoke shave. Um, a good trick, this curved sole spoke shave works pretty quickly. Uh, it's sort of the speed or the the ease of getting into an area as a knife would have, um, but it's speedier because it's it's like a little plane. Um, I can set a depth of cut and I can, you know, make the cut with confidence that it's not going to dig in um, in a way that I would not just wail away with a knife. Um, it just feels like a much faster way to do this, but as you get a, a tighter radius in the heel, you'll notice that it becomes greater than the, the radius of the sole, and your cuts get really small and difficult. Um, one way to counteract that is to just screw the blade out a little bit further, maybe a turn or two further than you would do for a flatter cut, um, just for the radius portion that you're trying to cut away on the heel. Um, that will allow you to get the spoke shave into a tighter radius and will cut just as easily as it was before you had achieved the tight radius in the heel. Um, and just a little bit of practice will have you cutting smoothly and quickly. Uh, and then you just turn the blade back out when you go back to the, the main shaft of the neck. Um, which is a good point that it's really nice to hold out for a spoke shave with the screw adjustment. Um, this is probably 10 times faster to adjust a good cut on than this one, where I have to unscrew the blade and then manually move it into position and hold it down and screw it back 
and then check that the cut's right and that it's also even across the whole sole of the, of the spoke shave and readjust. Um, with this one I can do the adjustment if I'm a little bit off, you know, I can adjust each side, it's really quick. Um, I can still make a really nice cut with the spoke shave, but it takes a lot longer to set up. Um, so yeah, I think the only other thought I have about this stage of roughing up, uh, which I'm not quite done with, but I'm getting really close to, is that um, I've got a tracing of uh, the final heel cap shape that I want. Um, but before I bring the heel down too far, I want to bolt this to the guitar and make sure that this um, pointed heel cap shape is actually in line with the, the center line of the guitar uh, on the back. It should be in line with the neck, but if it's even you know a tiny quarter of a, mil a quarter of a degree off or something, um, it's going to be very obvious. If this, to my eye, if this is out of line um, with the center line of the back. So I just want to make sure that that looks good before I carve so much of the heel off that I can't adjust it a tiny bit. Um, so yeah, I'm going to finish roughing this out. I'm going to check that. Um, I'm going to get started on the layout for uh, doing the soft V. And I'll probably uh, put the camera back on at that point. So I'll see you then. So I've got um, my profiles laid out. They're not exact um, because I don't have an exact model that I'm working on, uh, but they're close to what I imagine the Sophia uh, that I want will end up being. Um, and so I'm going to start taking measurements of the neck with the. Uh, with the contour gauge and working the neck down uh, on the shoulders to more closely match that profile and also in the center to match the height that I desire. Um, as you can see, I still have some of these saw curves, just a little bit of uh, a hint there. And I've divided the neck into two separate sections. There's a shoulder section and a center section. And I don't wanna work those at the same time. So I'm gonna mark the high spots on the shoulder. I'm gonna work the shoulder down um, until it more closely matches that shape and it feels good. One nice thing about doing uh, the rough out of the shoulder shape with the spoke shape is that if you're pulling it straight back along the length of the neck, uh, any high spots in the shoulder profile should carry across the entire length of the neck rather than wandering around as they might do if you were trying to shape that um, very rough shaping portion with the rasp. And so that makes it a lot easier to deal with those high spots as you can follow them down the whole length of the neck. I'm also going to work the taper down in the center. Um, the center I have is kind of wide because I want to end up with kind of a soft V uh, and it's kind of just a, a guideline. Um, so you can see here I have a flat spot, um, a low spot, so I'm going to make sure that I'm not working that spot as I bring the areas around it down. Um, the idea is to create a smooth transition the flows across the entire neck um, with no high spots and no low spots. I want to avoid those as much as I can uh, so that I end up with a neck that when I'm rasping is going to be easiest to take down. So it's also important to remember that um, as you leave the main shaft of the neck and enter into the peg head area or the heel, that that shape, the profile that you're making, is going to have to transition. Um, and the spoke shape won't be able to fully get into that transition while you're taking the, the shaft of the neck down. Um, so it's important to continue to shape those transitions as you're working the profile into the neck so that you can keep everything smooth, as smooth as possible, um, and make the job of doing the final refinement of the shape with the rasp and sandpaper uh, a lot easier. So at this stage I'm going to pause periodically and carve and rasp in shape the shape of um, that transition to maintain that transition rather than lose it because if I lose it then it's going to start telegraphing out into the main shaft of the neck where the spoke shape is going to run into high spots and, and it's not going to 
take that profile down as accurately as I want it to. Okay, so once I'm really happy with um, the contour that I've carved into the neck and I'm getting really close on the thickness of the neck, uh, I'm going to switch to the rasp and I'm going to mostly be focused on refining the shape and bringing everything down to the final thickness. Um, I've stopped off about a millimeter and a half thicker than what I expect the final thickness to be. Again, I'm doing this kind of by feel. Um, I don't have an exact shape that I'm aiming for. So I don't have an exact thickness, but I know I wanted about 23 millimeters and I'm sitting about 24 and a half when I switch to the rasp um, completely. And so I left it a little bit tall as far as thickness goes. I also, when I brought the, the sides in plane with the edges of the fingerboard, uh, I left a flat spot there, like completely flat. And I've been cutting the shoulder out of that, but I've left about a millimeter or so um, a flat spot right up against the edge of the fingerboard and I will continue to round that over as I work on the shape but by leaving that little bit of area it allows me to bring the shoulders in from both sides um, without having to do a lot of drastic changing to the shape of the profile um, and so when I first start rasping I'm still doing a little bit of refining uh, and getting you know spots out that the, the spoke shaves had left but that's not going to take me very long. And when I get further along, my cut is going to start becoming uh, a lot more rounded as I work up the neck. I'm really methodical about working up the neck and down the neck and not pausing at any particular spot because I, at this point I have the taper really well fit in. My profile is really good. I just want to cut everything down evenly and I'm not doing a lot of adjustment to, I'm not really doing any adjustment to you know, either the thickness of the neck at any point, the taper of the neck, profile of the neck is not getting a lot of adjustment and as I move it's getting less and less because I'm getting closer and closer to exactly how I want it. I might pull the neck off the fixture and check the feel and I might adjust it a little bit based on that but basically I'm where I want to be and I just want to take everything down evenly. So I'm having a really um, rounded cut with the rasp as I work uh, on one side and then on the other side moving up the neck not lingering in any one place. Um, I've also got a center line drawn so that I can visualize where I'm hitting in the center of the neck as I move to make sure I'm not going not far enough or too far. Um, and I will periodically round that off a little bit, smooth the ridge that I'm making, check the feel, check the thickness, see how close I'm getting. Um, when I'm feeling really good about the feel of the neck and the thickness of the neck is getting really close to to the final thickness, it's feeling really close to the final thickness. I'm going to switch to coarse sandpaper to work that in. Um, and after I run through the first grid of coarse sandpaper, I'm really going to try and check the feel of the neck, make sure that everything's smooth because that would be the best time to go back and, and adjust anything. If I have a high spot, a low spot, something I can feel with my fingers, that is the best time to go back and do it. It's also a really important time to check the transitions. Um, oftentimes, I like the heel transition. It's easy to get a high spot and not be able to visually see it, but you can feel it a little bit, um, and that's important to pay attention to. As I'm working down with the rasp, I'm also paying, you know, I'll make a pass in the neck, and then I'll pay a lot of attention to those transitions and are they smooth and is is the shape being maintained as it transitions into the different elements um, is there anything I can feel or see that's out of shape uh, all of that I want to address before I get very far into the sanding uh, because I don't want to work back from like 120 grit when I realize that there's a problem and then have to go back to the rasp and I don't want to have to go back very often because I don't want to take the neck thinner than I want it to be Okay, so I'm picking this up at the end of the sanding process. Uh, I thought I would save everybody a detailed sanding tutorial, um, but I did want to make a couple of notes about sanding the neck um, while carving before calling this finished. Um, I sanded this up to 220 grit. Uh, I started at 60 grit. It's pretty standard. Um, when you get to the actual sanding, of course, the profile and the taper are already 
well set. Um, they should be where you want them. And the sanding should just be about removing the rasp marks and bringing it down to the, the last little bit of thickness. Um, and with that in mind, um, it's important to focus on not changing the shape of the neck. Um, to that end, I always like to sand with something other than my hands uh, and something that will conform somewhat to the shape of the profile of the neck. Um, I find a little bit of folded up felt works really well for that. Uh, and another thing is that I tend to instinctually want to sand back and forth on the neck. Um, and just generally when I sand, I want to go back and forth. I think it's a common thing. Uh, but when you do that, it's going to tend to remove more material in the middle than on the edges. And you can change the shape of the neck in that way. Um, so I like to focus on making long, smooth sanding strokes from the headstock transition of the neck back through the heel and carry the, the whole sanding stroke through the heel so that I can work from one side of the neck to the other uh, and remove an even amount of material as I go. Uh, and then I only have a minimal amount of work getting into the harder to reach areas that need to be sanded at the transition um, for the headstock and right at the, the neck body join edge. Uh, the other thing to consider is that you don't want to overshoot the wood removal. You don't want to take the neck too far down and take too much wood away. So it's good to leave off rasping and start working on the sanding while there's still a little bit of margin before you get to the thickness you, you want to achieve. Um, this Spanish cedar is really soft. It's probably the softest Spanish cedar I've ever worked with. So I left about a half a millimeter to sand down um, and figured that if I had to do a little more sanding, it's easier to do that than to overshoot the thickness and just be left without being able to add any more material to go back to where I want it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it for neck carve. Uh, I hope you liked the video. If you did, uh, please hit the like button. And if you're interested in learning more about guitar building uh, in general or my specific sort of hand building process, you can subscribe to my channel uh, and check out my other videos. Um, you can also click the link in the description below to my website and read more about the one-on-one -on -one classes and consultation that I offer and just to see some more of my finished work. Um, yeah, I hope to see you next time. Hope you take care in the meantime and thanks for watching.